tablet. It's a weird echo. Echo. Anyways. 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 Uh, we, I, I, not even I can handle that. We gotta get that fixed. Does that mean we're good now? <laughs> Just give me the thumbs up. I'm gonna wait up here. Now we're good. Better? All right. All right. It's tolerable if it's not fixed. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Every, just give a big round of applause for what they do back there. That's a lot of work. I did it at camp meeting last year, and I've got to tell you, that's a busy place to be. Like, you wouldn't think so just sitting out here and just kind of watching everything taking place, but they are constantly doing something and making sure that there's no distractions for us in here, and we really thank you. Norma, Warren, thank you for what you do. We appreciate it. All right, so the question is, how could God just give the command to the Israelites to drive out the inhabitants of the land? How could God be so callous that he says, listen, we're not going to go cohabitate with them. We're going to completely drive them out, and this is going to be your home, and they're going to be gone. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 16. Sorry, Genesis chapter 15. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 15. Hold your fingers here. We will come back. Genesis chapter 15. I want to show you something. Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. To answer the question, how could God just wipe out these inhabitants? How could he just drive them out of their homes and their lands that they had made? How could he do this to them? Turn with me to Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 through 16. Genesis chapter 15, God is talking to Abraham here. God is talking to Abraham, and he's giving him a message, and that message is in verse 13, and he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for how many years? 400 years. So he's telling Abraham, he's like, listen, Abraham, I know that I've made a covenant with you. I know that I've told you that your seed is going to be my descendants. They're going to be as the stars of the sky. They're going to be uncountable. That's going to happen. But before that happens, I want you to know that they're going to be sent to a land that's not theirs, and they're going to be slaves. And for how long? Why? Why 400 years? Why are the Israelites, why are they going to be slaves to the Egyptians for 400 years? Verse 14. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, so in the 400, in 400 years, they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the what? Amorites is not yet what? Complete or full. Who are the Amorites? The inhabitants of the land of Canaan. God tells Abraham, you need to go to this promised land. He calls him from his home, and he says, I will make your descendants number greater than the stars of the sky. And you need to go to this promised land that I'm going to take you to. And so Abraham gets up, and he leaves, and he makes this covenant with God and with all of humanity. And then God tells him, listen, you can't go into the promised land quite yet. Your people are going to go into Egypt. They're going to be slaves there for 400 years. And why are they going to be slaves for 400 years? Because the iniquity of the Amorites is not complete yet. In other words, God was giving the Amorites, the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the promised land to the Israelites. He gave them 400 years to turn from their wicked ways. 400 years to come to repentance. 400 years to acknowledge that they were great sinners, that their ways were contrary to God, that they were out of harmony with Him, and that they needed to get in step with Him. For 400 years, God was merciful for them. For 400 years, God patiently bared with them. For 400 years, God withheld His anger and His indignation every time God would hear a prayer of the wicked oppressing the innocent God bear long and patiently with them, giving them a chance to repent. For 400 years when they sacrificed a child, God did nothing but communicate to them that this was not his way and that they needed to change or he was going to have to bring judgment. For 400 years, God sat by 
trying to get the message of repentance to them so that they could change before he was forced to destroy them. 400 years. Now, I can only imagine what that's like. I remember when I took karate, I was sparring with this lady one night. It was, we always did this. It wasn't full contact. It was just touch sparring. I was sparring with this lady one night, and she was telling me this story. She was telling me this story about how her son was being bullied by these kids at school. And she was angry, and she said, when I saw it, I wanted to get out of my car and go and thump them on the melon for picking on my son. That was one incident to her son by kids that were his age. Could you imagine what it's like to be God and see all the atrocities that the Amorites, the people, the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, are committing on a regular basis? They were into incest. They were into into witchcraft, which led to child sacrifice. What they were doing was a complete abomination to God, and it led them to take advantage of the innocent and the vulnerable on a regular basis. And for 400 years, God dwelt patiently, dealt patiently with them. And he said, please, turn from your ways. Now, we know that they couldn't be ignorant of what they were doing because Rahab tells us, go to Joshua, go to Joshua chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Joshua chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Rahab tells us that they knew who God was. Rahab tells us that they knew that the Lord was the creator of the heavens and earth. Rahab tells us that they knew, the people of Jericho knew that God was God and that he was the one that they should be listening to. She tells us that so we know that the Canaanites were not ignorant. Joshua chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And before they were laid down, she came up to them upon the roof. I should give you a little context before we read the story. So the spies have been sent to scout out the city of Jericho and to see if there be any weaknesses or how they should plot their attack or whatever to scout it out. And they're outed, they're, 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 they're seen by the people of Jericho, and they run to hide, and Rahab decides to help them. And this is where we pick up the story in verse 8, Joshua chapter 2, verse 8. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when he came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon, and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is what? God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. Did they understand who Yahweh was? Did they understand who Jehovah was? And how did she know that? Because God had already sent Abraham. He had already sent Isaac. He had already sent Jacob and all their families to witness to these Canaanite people. They knew who God was. He had sent his missionaries. He had sent his message of truth. He had told them of his love and of his goodness, and he had given them chances for 400 years to change their ways, but they refused. And finally, when the cup of their indignation was full, when God's mercy finally ran out, he had no choice but to send the Israelites in to drive them out and take down all their idols. The question I have for you is what more could God have done for the Canaanites? What more could he have done? He did everything in his power to get them to repent so that he didn't have to bring judgment on them. But they refused the goodness of God. And if we refuse the goodness of God, there's nothing left he can do for us either. He says, you leave me no choice. I have to allow judgment to consume you. But even though, even though God told the Israelites to drive out the inhabitants of the land. He left the Israelites with a stern warning. Go back to Numbers chapter 33. 
Go back to Numbers chapter 33. He gave them a sterling warning. You see, God is not a respecter of persons. God doesn't, doesn't say that you're a special people because I like you. God says you're a special people because who you follow. God says you're a special people because you're following me and you attach yourself to me and you're doing my ways. That's what makes you special because I'm special, not you. God says I'm not a respecter of persons and he gives the Israelites a very stern warning in Numbers chapter 33. We'll start in verse 54. Numbers 33 verse 54, and you shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families and to the, and to the more you shall give the more inheritance, and to the fewer you shall give the less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in place where his lot falleth according to the tribes of your fathers you shall inherit it. Right here in this verse, we see the fairness of God. God says, listen, you're going to divide this land fairly. If it's a big family, they're going to get more land because they take more land to provide for themselves. If it's a smaller family, they get less, but everybody's getting a portion that they need to take care of themselves. We see the fairness of God in digging out everything. He says, I'm not going to have a bunch of land barons who just own all this land and take advantage of the innocent. He says, that's not going to happen in my kingdom. You're going to get what you need and everybody's going to get their portion. We see the fairness of God in verse 54. And then he goes on in 55 to say, take heed to what I say. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do what? To them. He says, listen, when you go to drive out the inhabitants, make sure you drive them out completely. Make sure you destroy all their idols. Make sure you destroy all of their images. Make sure you get rid of all of it, because if you don't, it's going to be a snare that's going to trap you, and like a disease, it's going to take over you, and you are going to start following their ways. You're going to start following those practices, and I want you to understand this very clearly. God tells his people that as you see me doing to them through you, I am going to do to you through another people if you follow their ways. God is not partial. He has a standard. And he doesn't care what you call yourself or what you look like or what you wear. He says, this is my standard. And I'll give you the power to get there. But you better get there. You understand. And I don't want to put the emphasis on our works because that would be wrong. But what I'm trying to say is that Jesus says that I am not going to destroy another country, another tribe, another nation so that you can have their land and prosper just for you to do the same thing again. God strategically wanted that land for a very specific purpose. Does anybody know what that purpose was? geographically, that land, the promised land, was the trade route. You had to go through that land to get into Europe, to get over into the Middle East, and to get to Egypt. You had to pass through that land if you were a trader, if you were a businessman, if you wanted to make money in that economy. And so God wanted his people there with his message so that as everybody passed through, they would get what? His message. His gospel. They would learn about the true God. And he said, don't think for a second that I'm driving out these people so you can get in that land and do the same thing. And he says, but I want to warn you now. I don't want you to follow the practices that they did. I don't want to see their fate come upon you. I want to shield you from that. I want to protect you from that. So I'm telling you, you need to eliminate everything that they did so that you don't do the same thing. I don't know why. I don't know why. There's a lot of occult activity in northern Michigan. If you drive through Houghton Lake, Michigan, there is four 
occult businesses or shops or whatever you want to call them. You can go get your palm read or witchcraft or tarot readings or whatever. There's four different businesses in Holton Lake, Michigan, small little Holton Lake, Michigan, that deal in witchcraft. I don't know why it seems to be popular up in northern Michigan, but it is popular, and I would suggest to you that it's not only popular in northern Michigan. In fact, it's on the rise. Across all of America, sp spiritualism and witchcraft is becoming popular. And people are turning away from God, and they're turning back to these satanic practices. When people come out of the occult, they all have the same story, those who are successful. They must literally destroy everything that tied them to the occult. If they have any images, any pictures, any books, any games, any relics, any spells, whatever it is, you can't just throw them by the side. They must be destroyed, i.e., put in a fire, burned, until completely destroyed. Because if you don't destroy those things, Satan still has a foothold into your life. And if you don't think that stuff is real, I want to tell you. A friend of mine just sent this story to me about his brother. In fact, you guys know this friend of mine. Anybody remember Michael Taylor? Bible worker used to be here. He sent me this story about his brother who was dealing with some kind of foolery down in Florida, and he went to see this witch, and she says, you have been chosen. You need to come visit me. And he says, I don't have any money. She said, go to this store and buy this lottery ticket and scratch it off, and you'll have enough money to buy gas and food and a hotel room to come visit me. So he did, and guess what? He won. So he went down and he visited her. And she said, I need to do a ceremony for you. But after I do this ceremony with you, you're going to become rich and you're going to have everything that you ever wanted. So he gets ready to do this ceremony. And strange things start happening. And he gets scared. And he can't handle it anymore. Now this happened probably six years ago. He gets scared and he can't handle it anymore. And he decides that he doesn't want anything to do with it. So he stops her and he runs out of that house. And as he's running out of that house, something stops him, throws him on the ground and starts choking him. He says he could not breathe. It scared him so bad that he started praying to Jesus, Lord, help me. And as soon as he prayed, it let him go, but he ran to his car and it wouldn't let him get into his car. So he called his brother Michael and he said, Michael, I am scared. This is what's going on. The devil is attacking me and I don't know how to get out of it. You need to pray for me. And he started praying for him and he was able to get into his car and drive away. And his brother said, you need to go to the first pastor in that area that you see. You need to have him pray with you. You need to destroy all that stuff. You need to get out of that. But he didn't. And he got pulled right back in. Brothers and sisters, sin is the same way. The occult is a dramatic example of what that is. But sin is the same way. God says that when I deliver you from your sin, you need to destroy it. You need to get rid of whatever it is that links you to it. You don't quit smoking by leaving cigarettes in your car. God says, get rid of them. You're not going to get victory over drinking if you're addicted by having a six-pack in your refrigerator. Something's going to trigger you, and you're going to go back to it. you got to destroy it. you got to eliminate it. If you have friends that are caught in drugs, and that's all they talk about, that that's all they do, I'm here to say you need to cut them off. Now, there may be a time in the future you can reconnect with them when God's given you victory and you have strength, but until that time comes, cut them off. Distance yourselves from them until God's given you strength and victory. You need to eliminate any link you have to sin because it will pull you right back in. And God says, don't think. Two things. Don't think that it won't do to you what it did to the inhabitants of the land. 
Because like a disease, it will make you do the same things that they did. And we've seen that from the Israelites. Number two, God says, don't think that just because you call yourself my son or daughter, that I'll treat you differently than I treat them. Because if you start acting like them, I'm going to have to deal with you like I deal with them. We need to cut the head off the serpent and then get rid of the body. You can't let it dwell with you. It will become a barb in your side. It will get its clutches back a hold of you and it will pull you right back in. You might have to make some drastic decisions in your life. God will help you. But I'm here to tell you, if God is asking you to cut something off, I don't care what it is, cut it off. There was a time in my life I couldn't even talk to my own family. Now I got to a spot where God said, okay, you're, you're good now. You can talk to them. But I had to cut them off. And I know that these are hard decisions to make, but let me tell you something. Nothing is more important than Jesus Christ. Nothing should have a higher priority in your life than Jesus Christ. And if something is getting between you and Jesus, cut it off. Get rid of it. Drive it out of the land. When he strengthens you, then maybe you can be that witness to that person. If you listen to him, amen. For Joey, the 12-step approach worked for a while. Then Joey was prescribed Vicodin in the hospital for an ailment, and he relapsed again. Six months later, he robbed a local gas station to get money to buy drugs. After he robbed that gas station, his conscience was pricked, and he turned himself into the police and did two years in the state of penitentiary. He went to the police station. He said, you need to arrest me. And the officer was like, what? He said, yes, I robbed that gas station yesterday. And he said, why are you telling me? And Joey said, because I know tomorrow I'm going to feel worse. You need to arrest me. When he got behind bars... And there was no trace of drug that he could get a hold of. The distractions were gone. Joey finally got victory. And was able to break free from the addiction of drugs. If your right eye offend thee, pluck it out. If your right hand causeth thee to sin, cut it off. Brothers and sisters, we need to eliminate the sin. And all traces of it from our houses, from our cars, from our lives. And if we need to sever relationships for a while, what would keep you from doing that? Who is willing to say today, Jesus, I want to be delivered completely from those things that ensnare me and entrap me. And I'm willing to even make the sacrifices of cutting off anything I need to, anything you tell me to, I will cut it off so that I can be one and whole with you. Who's there with me? Amen. Our closing hymn is number 309.